hopefully you all have your screen arranged in the way that you like and your volume set where you like. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, we do hope this is a dynamic conversation, um, but in the meantime, if you're not speaking, you might keep your mute on just in case you have a, a dog who wanders in and is very chatty or a, a housemate of any kind. Um, and uh, and just uh, we'll probably interrupt you if you're talking and your mute is still on. Just We'll, we'll flag you down because we're all guilty of that. Um, but welcome to our Read Across Lawrence Bring Your Own Book Club um, Roundhouse Edition, COVID Edition. Normally we would be in the galleries of the Spencer Museum and tapping into the Lawrence Public Library's Read Across Lawrence program with a sort of wandering of the galleries and wondering about the ways that the themes of that year's book connects with works of art on view. So uh, again, another advantage is that we're not just limited to the small fraction of our collections that we have on view in the galleries. I, I can't see, my name is not on here, I'm in my, oh, oh, no. yeah. Do you need some technical help? Yeah, I've got, I don't have a name, but I have a J Weinberg address. Yeah, let us know if you need Oh, there you are. Hi there. Hi. Welcome, Hi. welcome. So I was just saying that, you know, one advantage of, of being virtual is that you can get rid of that with the X. Okay, just you. Here, I'm going to, I'm going to mute you real quick. Um, I'm like, do you, do you need technical help? Okay. Okay. Let us know if you need anything. So we have access to the entire collection of 45,000 plus works of art, um, which is not typical when we're in the galleries. Um, so you're looking at the museum on the left, the exterior view of the building, and you're looking at some signs that were installed for our exhibition, The Power of Place, KU Alumni Artists last Please. year. And, and we'll be talking about those signs specifically in just a moment. Um, but I do want to acknowledge them and acknowledge the land that the museum sits on with a statement that we developed um, in recent years. And that is that we at the Spencer Museum of Art collectively acknowledge that the University of Kansas occupies the historical homelands of the Kanza or Kaw, Shawnee and Osage people. We also recognize and advocate for the sovereignty of the tribes who currently reside in Kansas, the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, the Kickapoo tribe in Kansas, the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska, as well as members of the Delaware, Quapaw, and Wyandotte Nations. We also affirm indigenous sovereignty, support the needs of American Indian peoples, and commit to indigenizing the Spencer Museum of Art. So we invite you to join us in those efforts. Um, so I'm gonna hope that my slide advancer works here. Oh, no, there we go. Um, so these are, are the signs themselves. And uh, just reading the, the top left one on my screen says, Kansas, today your host is Iowa. So I think it's a perfect segue into introducing you to our hosts for this program. And Deanne, it seems fitting that you introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, my name is Deanne DeRoyne and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Um, just to give you a little background on my perspective today, I actually am a retired family physician and community health specialist. So I'm kind of out of my league when it comes to art and literature, but I hope to do my best in terms of relating what we're doing today to various native cultures throughout the country as best I can. Thank you so much, Deanne. Kristen, how about you? Hi, I'm Kristen Soper. I'm the events coordinator at Lawrence Public Library. And um, I just uh, wanna thank the NEA Big Read. They gave us a grant for us to do all of our programming surrounding the, the, the Roundhouse and um, allowed us to buy a thousand books to distribute um, amongst the community. And I just wanna note the NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts designed to broaden our understanding of our world, our communities, and ourselves through the joy of sharing a good book. The Lawrence Public Library is one of 78 not-for-profit organizations 
to receive a grant to host an NEA Big Read project. The NEA presents NEA Big Read in partnership with Arts Midwest. And then I also want to take a moment um, to thank all of our really wonderful community partners. KU Libraries, Haskell Indian Nations University, Haskell Tomini Library, the Lawrence Public Library Friends and Foundation, the Willow Domestic Violence Center, the Raven Bookstore, and of course the Spencer Museum of Art. And I just really want to thank Adina and Deanne for all of the work that they've put into this program. Um, doing things online is um, a bit more work than when we would just go around the galleries and look at art and say, let's talk about this. You know, um, it, it's a lot more heavy. It's a lot more of a heavy lift to do programming in COVID. So I just really, really want to thank Adina and Deanne for all of the work that they've um, put into this. And I did throw up some links in the chat. Um, our, we have another program tomorrow um, surrounding our Big Read programming. It's Rachel Louise Snyder, she's written a book called No Visible Bruises. That's a um, investigative account of domestic violence in the US. Um, so there's a link there in the chat uh, where you can register for that event. There's also a link for our upcoming book talks. Um, if you've read the book and you wanna discuss it, um, there are opportunities to do so. And then also as we go through the slides tonight, um, I've compiled uh, a digital resource list if you want to revisit some of those resources and um, look at them in greater depth. So please take advantage of those links if it interests you. And now I'll pass things back off to Adina. Great. Thanks so much, Kristen and, and Deanne as well. Um, I'm Adina Duke. I'm in our public engagement department at the Spencer Museum of Art. and. Um, the way that we are sort of conceiving of this is that we've chosen a selection of works of art that resonate with themes in the book. So it's a way of talking about the book through art, if you will. And um, uh, <coughs> pardon me. Um, each each one uh, one of us will take the lead on. But again, it's not meant to be a lecture. Um, we hope that uh, a prompt that one of us provides might uh, generate a lot of provocative discussion among all of you. So um, help us in that effort, if you will. Um, but we thought we might sort of set the scene a little bit or help help us sort of transport ourselves back either out of our homes uh, and uh, to any, any place, but back to um, March, if that's when you read the book, since this program would have taken place in the spring, um, or transport yourself to the time and place of the book by helping us kind of visualize that setting. Does anyone want to throw out a few um, descriptive words that come to mind when thinking about the setting? Where it's located or what the season, what the air well, like? Well, it's not in the Southwest, it's up there, it's in the North. And so that was a whole different environment than what we think of as an Indian reservation. I mean, I tip, what I typically think of as an Indian reservation. That's a really great point, um, that we all have a sort of go-to place when we think of something and we associate right. either right. because of our experience or we've visited um, or something we've seen in pop culture. Anyone else have a, a sort of scene setting for us? Maybe one more. The lake is what comes to my mind first. The lake, yeah. And of course, one is more likely to visit the lake in a particular season, right? Um, so it takes place in the summertime. I, I, I suppose you go ice fishing up in the north. I'm, I'm from Houston originally, so I don't know anything about ice fishing. Um, but yeah, it takes place in the summertime. Uh, the, the boys who are the subject of the book are on, on summer break, right? And it's up north in, um, in, no, in North Dakota, what is now North Dakota. Um, so we'll come back to Edgar's signs here in a second. Um, but do you know, I will just add, you know, in the, as the three of us were preparing, we discussed the fact that the author doesn't actually identify her reservation, which is Turtle Mountain, Chippewa. Uh, but as I was rereading the book the last couple of days, she refers to the Peace Park, 
And the Peace Park is actually on the North Dakota Canadian border. So in mm -hmm. fact, she must really, in, she's talking about home, even though she doesn't identify it as home. Interesting, yeah. Well, in, in looking at the images of Edgar Heap of Bird signs here, um, and talking about trans, transporting ourselves or locating or dislocating ourselves, um, what, what sort of observations do you all have about the signs that we're seeing here? And again, if you weren't here at the beginning, let me just see if I can go back. Oh, no, I'm going forward. Um, my arrow buttons don't seem to be cooperating. There we go. Um, this is the signs in front of the Spencer Museum. What do you notice about the signs? You can talk about the colors or the way that they're arranged, the text that's on there. What jumps out at you? That Kansas is backwards. Yeah, Kansas is backwards. And of course, artists are always making choices uh, when they're creating their work. So it's a very intentional choice. Does anyone want to take a guess about what Edgar's choices are intending? Maybe he thinks Kansas is backward in their <laughs> views, maybe in their views of the Native American community. I, I don't know. That's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. certainly. It grabs your attention anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You know, whenever you pass a sign that says, don't look at this sign, of course you notice the sign, right? Well, let's um, jump ahead and we'll come back to Edgar's signs here in a bit. Um, we've interspersed some, some quotes from the book with the works that, um, that are chosen from the Spencer Museum. Would anyone like to read this one out loud? I'll read it. Go right ahead. Uh, it seemed increasingly important to me that each one of these invaders be removed down to the very tip of the root where all the vital growth was concentrated. And it's coupled with this image of some plant material, right? And we typically are, are accustomed to seeing what's growing out from the top, right? And so what does that coupling of that quote with this work of art signify to you? Or what part of the book does it conjure? Yeah. Well, it was neat the way that um, the author had that same image at the ending as well as at the very beginning of trying to get the roots out of the father out of his parents cabin and um, trying his desperation to to get it all rooted out that if any of you've been to the land institute out in salina kansas you'll see the wheat that is growing there and then they pull some of it up and some of those roots are going down to six and seven feet and it was just shocking to see that how deep the roots had to go in their case for the wheat. And um, it reminded me of that when I was reading Erdrich. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and to that, I would like to add that to the best of my knowledge, the Turtle Mountain uh, Chippewa people were not moved. Uh, they, may, they are still in what was probably or very very close to their original homeland so that their roots are very deep and if there's anyone who is who has knowledge to the contrary please share it because we're all here learning together and heather mentions a uh, need to consider the depth of of roots um in the chat so i'm just calling attention to the chat too. If you don't want to uh, speak locally, you're welcome to throw things in the chat as well and we'll share those. Yeah, and I see oh. it from here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this particular um, image here we see is from Melissa Bob. She's a lung artist and um, 
It's a, a screen print, mono print, collage, wove paper, and collagraph. And some of those terms I'm, I'm not very familiar with, but I'm thinking, um, you know, since we're probably watch, seeing this on like a two-dimensional screen, thinking that there, there is kind of a three-dimensional element of this um, with the collage and um, woven paper. Um, so I think it's kind of important to keep that in mind too, but you can kind of see in the top image, you know, you, you have something that looks like a blue sky and then um, maybe like a green, um, green land and then again the roots kind of going underground and then this red line that you see is uh, reminiscent of the peaks and valleys made by a, a, a heart rate monitor. And then when you go down to the image right below it, you know, you kind of have a similar image, but the land um, is gray now. It has um, houses that are very similar. You know, the sky is yellow that's kind of, um, you know, discolored as, as is like where, where the roots are being put down. And then your heart rate monitor image here is kind of flattening out. So, um, you know, this piece, I think talks about, um, you know, confronts the historical events that changed in particular the artists people. Um, and this is just a quote from the card beginning in the 1800s territorial expansion by Anglo American settlers encroached upon and destroyed the land of Native Americans. So it's just talking about how, you know, as um, colonial forces moved west, you know, they kind of completely changed the, the landscape. And when you look at the quote that's coupled with it, um, you can kind of think about those roots being displaced from the land. And in the book on page 149, you know, he talks about his mom's job is to trace those roots and those lineages um, for tribal affiliations and how uh, kind of regimented the US government identity is kind of enforced on their people. And um, I think this is a really good quote to go with this image about how sort of inorganic that system is. And when we were putting this together, you know, um, Deanne mentioned, you know, about how um, indigenous people even got their last names, you know, how that was um, a process that was really inorganic and forced upon them. And so um, I think, again, you know, this kind of ties in the root imagery and then it has also ties in the identities. Um, of you know the folks in the story uh, of the indigenous people in the story and there are so many aspects to this i mean as you say this was geraldine's job so and this is really the basis for the whole for the whole book because it was her needing to enroll the infant and having the files on who the infant's parents really were that caused her to be the victim in the first place. Um, and Kristen, as you've said, and, and also, this also relates to the sexuality issues that are more or less dominant throughout the book. Um, because often it's the enrollment officer who knows who the stated father is, but who also knows who the real father is, just depending upon the situation at that time. And there are various uh, stringent rules and regulations, which may differ from tribe to tribe, federally recognized tribes, um, in terms of who can enroll a child. For example, if the, um, I mean, it has to be a parent, a mother or a father who is an enrolled member. Uh, a grandparent can't do it in most cases. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's a very rigid system. And of course, it, it, it also is the origin of the blood quantum uh issue which we don't need to talk about but it's related to this as well uh, and and it just makes me think about intersectional identities which is you know a, 
something that we're talking a lot about in the university setting and um, how an identity can be associated with a bloodline or with a particular uh, land or other roots. And because of the many mixed marriages, the sort of complicating factors that are introduced um, by that and, and who defines your identity and your, the ability to define it for yourself. Every federally recognized tribe has an enrollment officer. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to make any observations or comments about this before we move to the next one? Okay. Would someone like to read this quote for us? And you don't have to raise your hand, you can just jump right in. The roundhouse is on the far edge of tribal trust, where a court had jurisdiction, though of course not over a white man, so federal law applies. Thank you so much. So this, this is again a, a sort of locating image of, of the map of North Dakota that gives you a sense of um, those boundaries, right? of what we know as North Dakota now and the reservations that reside within those current boundaries. Um, and again, as Deanne mentioned, it borders on Canada. So there's also a relationship, a tribal relationship between peoples on both sides of, of those national borders as well as the state borders. Has anyone spent any time in North Dakota? Deanne. <laughs> And here is another map. Um, and I think Kristen, were you gonna take it away on, on this one? Is that right? Yeah, so for, um, this is an artist, Chris Papon. Oh, and Heather has a, has a question in the chat. Is the enrollment officer an indigenous person? And at least, could, could you speak to that at all, Deanne? Do you? Does it uh, yes. I mean, it virtually always is. I, I personally haven't known of a situation where it was a non-Native person or a non-tribal member. It might be a, a member of another nearby tribe, but usually it's the, the uh, tribe who's enrolling. Yeah. Okay, well, this, this is by an, uh, an artist, Chris Capon, and um, he does a lot of ledger art, which I wasn't really familiar with, but um, it's a form of art that I think is um, kind of has its origin in indigenous, um, with indigenous people where you would, you know, draw or paint on um, ledgers. And this, um, I, I watched a short video of him you know, where he talked about he would create these painted maps um, to kind of call forth that image of old maps. And then this particular image has this, you know, kind of distorted um, tribal elders on it. And um, in this particular series, he focuses on the removal and relocation events to the Central Plains in what became Indian Territory in present day Kansas and Oklahoma. And the distorted figures um, of people endemic to these areas are juxtaposed on the map to show the impact of how a simple little line on a map can devastate an entire populace. The figures are distorted because people have a distorted view of American Indians in their minds. And he says, we are also guilty of distorting that image as well. So it's kind of a comment on the, you know, moving of indigenous peoples and then the very distorted lens that, um, you know, our culture has come to view indigenous people um, with. So did anyone, does, does anyone else have any comments on the picture or on the style of art or? 
I'm wondering, is was the track star and then Olympic miler and winner of many gold medals, Billy Mills, wasn't he Lakota Sioux? Correct. That's right. Okay. But he but he did attend Haskell and KU. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that's why I knew him. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. My husband ran with him on the track team. Oh, exciting. Which, which one? Haskell, KU, or the Olympic team? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it was the KU track. Okay. Yeah, this whole business of uh, location and relocation and displacement is so important. And, you know, that's a whole seminar in and of itself. But what's really one of the things that's interesting to me going beyond Indian Territory, but it includes Indian Territory, and that is think of the entire central United States as the Louisiana Purchase. And um, that explains why, in other words, it was French. And that explains why when you go to Turtle Mountain, many of the people have French names. And one of the, th I, I happen to love names and I happen to love French. I'm one of those people with the French name because my grand, both of my uh, grandfathers on my native side were um, trader trappers. And um, when I went to Turtle Mountain, the first thing I did when I got there was took out the phone book and looked at all those fabulous French names, except you wouldn't necessarily recognize them. Like one of my grandfather's was, um, last name was D-D-A, D-I-D-I-E-R. But in Indian country, that's pronounced D-G. And um, I, I knew that there was a family story that our grandmother, and my grandmother was born in 1869. That's my grandmother, not my great grandmother. And there was a story that she'd gone to Haskell, which I didn't believe because Haskell supposedly started by taking little ones like five-year-olds and then gradually added older children. But they had found the original registrar's ledger in, uh, oh, this was in the early 2000s, and a student was going through it. And I said, well, you know, supposedly my grandmother is here, and I gave her her name. And I got a call a couple weeks later, and she said, I found your grandmother. And she was listed as Mary D-G, D-E-E-G-E-E. -E -E -E. <laughs> and she realized that that was my grandmother, whose real French name was DDA, but you know, that's what happens. And that goes back to the whole naming issue as well and how names get clobbered. But at any rate, so there are many interesting stories about relocation and dislocation. Well, that brings to mind the things on Lewis and Clark's uh, voyage and discoveries because of um, Sacagawea's um, husband was uh, French. I, I can't remember his name now. Char Charbon Charbonneau. Okay. Char Charbonneau. Yeah, something like that. And right. uh, uh, so that was very instrumental in their uh, being able to translate the Mandans and then onto the other ones as they went into Wyoming and Montana. If they hadn't mm -hmm. had her, they would have been wiped out. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, and thinking about the language aspect too, there's that portion in the novel, um, I think where Grandma Ignatia and Musham are talking and she mentions that the the TH sound, the th becomes the duh. Indeed, that's right. But, yeah, becomes like the, the harder uh, consonant. Um, and then, you know, he talks about, you know, going to school and, you know, always using the the. Yes. But once he crosses back over um, onto the reservation, you know, he hardens that to the harder duh. And I thought, yeah. I thought that was, you know, kind of that code switching, but also the tie to the um, Chippewa language as well. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I'd forgotten about that, that little story within. Yeah. I'll move us to our next image here. Um, does anyone know what a map what, what this map is? North America upside down. North America upside down, or um, a, a different view of North America. Oh, viewed, viewed from the pole. Oh, right, that's right. Yeah, so. Um, 
So this, this image is from um, a website called Decolonial Atlas, um, and there's some wonderful resources on that uh, website, um, but the creator was seeking out um, maps created by um, indigenous cultures from around the globe and is a cartographer himself and is, is creating additional maps um, through interviews and other research. So definitely encourage everyone to to check that out. But again, this goes back to Edgar's signs and this transposition of of images and language and words and phrases um, and even how, how maps are viewed. Um, so I'll move us on to the next one. Um, would anyone like to read this quote for us? Marshall, Chief Justice 1802 to 35, was vested absolute title to the land in the government and gave Indians nothing more than the right of occupancy a right that could be taken away at any time. Even to this day, his words are used to continue the dispossession of our land. Thank you so much. So this is a, a book that's been on view at the Spencer several times in recent years. Has anyone seen this on view at the museum? Um, it is uh, by an artist named Gina Adams, who teach at Haskell and who is an alum of KU from just a few years ago. Um, and it's part of her Broken Treaties quilt series. Um, and Deanne, I think, were, were you going to sort of take the lead on this one? Shall I bounce it back over to you? Yes. Um, and it relate, you know, obviously it relates to that quote that um, we just read. Uh, so first of all, the Indian Native people were put on lands, but given no title to the land. And they were sort of pushed around on the land. And sometimes they were brought into a fort. Sometimes they were forced to live outside the fort. Without being in their usual environment and with their usual tools and what they needed in their uh, gardens was basically genocide at that time. And then um, one by one, the federal government began to create treaties. And uh, typically that would identify land, that would identify certain services that the federal government was going to offer. Usually that would entail health, education, and welfare, and I'm not exactly sure how they defined welfare, and it was probably different in, in every sense. And that happened uh, mostly through like the Iowa's the tribe moving us to Kansas was 1837. I know that Kickapoos and I believe Prairie Bend also, uh, 1854 was the date of their last treaty here. However, uh, just as we were given those lands and began to, um, you know, accommodate to a new environment in terms of finding the resources to sustain yourself. Um, in 1887, something called the Dawes Act was passed. And that was another brilliant idea of how to get land. And the idea of the Dawes Act was that, um, and I thought it was each family would get 160 acres. But I was, as I was looking more closely to my father's allotment certificate, my father was born in 1891, and his allotment certificate is dated 1893, which means he was just two years old when uh, this certificate uh, was, was uh, given to the family, saying that here is the location of my father's 160 acres. Now, the problem with the Allotment Act Actually, there were several problems. One was the government wanted to break up the cultures of the tribal communities by giving everybody their land. And a lot of people didn't even have the concept of what owning your own plot of land meant at that time. The other, the other objective of the, um, maybe the second objective of the uh, federal government was to um, make Indians farmers. They thought, you know, we'll give them this land, it's farmland, they'll learn how to be farmers and they'll be self-sustaining and we won't have to be responsible for them. The third reason though, was that there was always more land in the original treaty than there was given in the allotments. So the excess land, then the federal government then sold uh, to more settlers. And it really, like to our tribe, it was really injurious in the sense that, um, adapting 
to owning your own land and building your own house, cabin, whatever. Um, we have some pictures of cabins from that time really separated you from the communal values and relationships. And we nearly lost all of our culture. And fortunately, we've been working on regaining it, um, but it was really devastating to a lot of tribes. And so all of that was going on. The law passed in 1887, and all of that was going on around, um, in the 1890s. And then there was a whole other era in the 1950s, which was the era of termination. And that was, absolutely the legal term for denying trees uh, is abrogation and Congress abrogated the treaties of several tribes uh, many of whom were able to uh, get good legal help and manage to maintain their reservation and uh, for example the Menominees up in Wisconsin where there's tons of forest um, had a good business in, uh, in forestry uh, and they, they had their own lumber mill etc and the federal government said, well, it looks like you're doing okay, so we don't really need to you know, help you in any other way. And um, there were lots of other negative effects throughout the country through termination, but um, they were actually able to regain theirs and they continue as a federally recognized tribe. That may be more than you wanted to know. <laughs> No, that's such great context, Deanne, for sort of setting um, setting up a reading of of Gina's quilts. In fact, um, and I think having having that sort of background um, will, I hope, enhance the way that you all experience this. And I, I hope that you'll have a chance to experience it in person before too long. But um, you know, is this a typical quilt that that you might have at home? I guess is a question I would pose. Does anyone have a quilt that looks like this, or does anyone have a quilt at home? I actually just wanted to make a note about this one, about this quilt, is that Gina Adams actually uses antique quilts. So she finds antique quilts and then she appliques these words on top of them. And so you have this combined history of the words that she's putting on there. And there's the history of the broken treaties, but then there's also the history, the personal history of every individual quilt that she works with. And so I think that's kind of an interesting background to this particular artwork. A literal and, background and a, yeah. a figure <laughs> background, right. And, and so the text that's on there um, is, it's very difficult to read, right? Going back to sort of what Dan said at the outset. Um, I, I mean, has anyone tried to sort of discern what the, the text says mm -hmm. with success or with great difficulty? Mm -hmm. Or has anyone noticed anything in particular about the text? Well, this is a Comanche quilt. It looks like it's um, 1867. Well, it's a Comanche treaty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I should note that this is the front of the quilt and the back of the quilt. Oh. Are each of these letters then hand quilted on or is it any painting? Is it all fabric? It's all fabric applique, mm -hmm. all hand cut. Um, and I'll show you an image in, in just a moment here. Thank you. Um, but going back to Edgar's signs um, and something that one of you observed about Edgar's signs, is there any sort of resonance between his signs and, and this? quilt here. And it may be hard to see on the screen, but if you looked carefully at some of the letters, you might notice that some of them are also backwards. Yes, yes. And some of them are quite, you know, low color and just very difficult to read. So imagine being, I mean, we've all seen the fine print on whatever, you know, credit card statement or doctor's bill, right? And so being presented with a contract or a treaty that is impossible to read and make sense of and um, is then binding and set this very difficult circumstance, which is really at the heart of the book. Um, so some of the letters are transposed. Um, you can see a G in the word pledge, I think, um, is one that's pretty visible. And the fabric that she's using is, is calico fabric. Does anyone know about the history of calico fabric? No. Yeah. So calico fabric was one of the first fabrics um, that was sort of circulated uh, as a commodity. Um, and so uh, the, the white uh, European Americans um, were profiting off of calico fabric. And um, so that's another sort of intentional choice that the artist has made. 
thanks Angela for sharing the, the link there. Um, Jean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Casey, one of our curators who knows Gina personally, um, so that she's purchased, that Gina purchased the quilt in Lawrence. Um, so it's very connected to place. Yeah. So let me just show you a couple images of Gina. Um, oh, first we have to have another volunteer read us a quote. Does anyone want to read this for us? Lark committed the crime. On what land? Was it tribal land? Fee land? White property? state. We can't prosecute if we don't know which laws apply. So what, what part of the book is uh, that located in? Does anyone remember sort of? Near the end. Oh, it's toward the end. Yeah, I mean it's at the beginning, the of was, right? It kind of bookends the book. It's a, a problem at the outset and it's a, a sort of problem going forward. Um, so here, here's an image of Gina's quilt on view alongside some other works of hers from an exhibition that we held in 2017 called Separate and Not Equal, A History of Race and Education in America. And that looked at um, both indigenous um, Native Americans and, um, and black, um, black education. Here's an image of Gina at work. It's always nice to see a picture of the artist, uh, a, an artist so happily at work, in fact, um, hand cutting right. all these letters. And another quote. Would anyone else like to read this one for us? This one is the one I'd abolish right in this minute if I had the power of a movie shaman. Oliphant v. Squamish took from us the right to prosecute non-Indians who commit crimes on our land. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes. And I think we decided that I would talk about this one. As you can see, this is a small cadre of Indian police. East, and they're up at Standing Rock, which is the um, northwest corner of South Dakota, but it crosses over into southern North Dakota as well, the Standing Rock Reservation. And you can see that this was probably around 1854. It turns out I had to be taught by um, Adina that uh, when you have a wide span of time on these works, it means that um, because the person who Will you, Adina, you explain that to us. You can do a better job, I think, and then I'll talk about that. Oh, sure. Um, uh, the 1834 to 1934. Um, yeah, so, and in, in actually, the, that's the photographer's life dates, um, but there are other examples in here, and um, certainly we can talk about that, but there's a date um, that a work of art is made, and then there's also an accession number, um, and just to keep keep it streamlined. I didn't end up including the accession numbers on here, but I do have the dates of, of the works of art when they're known. And sometimes that date range spans quite a lot um, when it's either an older work or a work that was acquired um, many years ago when museum practices were different and the cataloging that took place um, was, was different, or things were acquired in a way that um, would not, uh, would not, you know, would not happen today. Um, so if you think about exploitation of people and resources and um, in the way that some of our, some older collections and museums might have been acquired. And so oftentimes there's a very wide date range that um, makes it difficult to really pinpoint it. This Thank one. You. So you will see on some, of the, on some of the works, there's just that range, in this case, 1854 to 1934. But we're fortunate in this one and that it specifies that this was taken in 1891. And when I see this, it actually for me is, um, it's very sad to me because I look at these, it's like, I don't know whether these men um, have volunteered to be police or they had no choice but to be the tribal police. And because the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs existed by this time and every reservation had a superintendent 
uh, and an agency, or sometimes like uh, for the four tribes of uh, Kansas, the agency is in the little town of Horton, Kansas, for all four tribes. And the superintendents had a great deal of power. And they, they made decisions. They were often the people, who were, you know, listing the members of the tribe would hand out names. And, you know, and that's why we have people who have their uh, original family name, either in the original language or sometimes it's translated, or they were given the name of the superintendent in some cases or some other name. So um, it makes me feel very sad when I see this because I don't really know. But, but the point is that everything was very regimented. I mean, just as the boarding schools were regimented, uh, the governance of the, the reservation was regimented uh, until into the um, 20th century when governance changed again by federal law. You know, and it reminds me in the book of at the very beginning when they're waiting for the police to arrive, they don't know which police is, is coming. So they, they're already sort of at a disadvantage um, before they even arrive, not knowing who is, is going to respond to this crime. Um, but, know, but this was also in a very interesting time because tribes were not allowed to practice their cultural rituals. This is the same time that something called the ghost dance evolved and people had to secretly uh, hide their ceremonies. And so we don't really know if some of these men in their uniforms really are ghost dance participants. It's sort of like they have these two separate identities and never the twain shall meet in terms of trying to maintain the culture. At the same time, they were following whatever the rules of the superintendent were at that time. Mm. Well, and Deanne, you're, you're encouraging me to look more closely at the posture of the men in this photo. Would anyone want to describe how, how the posture of these men reads to you? If you were standing in that way, how would you describe your posture? Stiff. Say it again, Carol, I'm sorry. I think they're looking very stiff. Stiff, yeah. With forced. Forced. With uh, anyone else? There seems to be a bit of resignation. Um, yes, yes. A, a sort of, I'm trying to find the right words for it. Does anyone have a better word than resignation? But I think of it in contrast to submission. <laughs> submission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you know, um, I just looked it up to be sure I had the date right. Now, Standing Rock is um, the northwest corner of South Dakota. Uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, the home of Wounded Knee, is the southwest corner of South Dakota. But it was just December of 1890 that the Wounded Knee Massacre happened. Oh. So, you know, we have to think of that in terms of the big picture here. Yeah. Well, let me move us into the next one. Um, Could I ask that about that wounded knee? Is that the one where Crazy Horse was? Is that the wounded knee? I don't recall that Crazy Horse was there, but I'm not a historian, so I couldn't tell you for sure. Yeah, if anyone else knows, um, feel free to throw it in the chat so we can all see. Sure. Would anyone like to read this quote here? I will. This is Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. We sat together staring at a picture of a pioneer woman sitting on a hot hillside with her baby lying next to her, shaded beneath a black umbrella. We agreed that we had never really cared for the picture, and now we were going to actively hate it, though this was not the picture's fault. Mm -hmm. It's such a 13-year-old boy sort of perspective, isn't it? Um, so this is a, a study, um, and it's from a, a body of work that was realized in the nation's post offices. Um, has anyone seen any of the post office murals or the documentary that came out last year? I don't know how many of them survive, but um, so this was a sketch for a post office mural in Wichita. Um, does anyone want to describe the scene that we're looking at? Oh, 
Oh, little bighorn. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Angela and Casey, our, our resident experts. So what's, what's right here in the middle of the scene? I was gonna say it looks like some kind of holdup, but I'm kind of interested by the three modes of transportation. You have the train, the carriage, and the horse. Right, right. So there's a progression of time, right? From left to right of modes of transportation. And then um, what about the figures in the foreground? How would you characterize them? Or if you think about different identities like we were talking about before, what identities are present? The bad Indian. Yeah, the Indian is, we can't see the Indian's face, right? It's um, a figure who's turned away from the viewer and crouched, right? And who are the other figures there? The two figures on the right almost seem like not tourists, but you know, she's looking at a map or something and they have arrived after all this other has taken place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I mean, of, the of question the is that it was so hard at the beginning and now she's traveling in style and he is too. And uh, there, aren't any, uh, there aren't any obstacles at that point. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So imagine if, if our, our protagonist, Joe, is confronting an image like this and which identity he identifies with, right? And when one is sort of surrounded by images like that, the kind of um, feelings that, that take root, going back to roots, and um, that sort of stir with your emotions and um, and when you're seeing those kinds of images everywhere, um, how that affects your confidence and, and your sense of belonging. And it, it makes me think too of the Confederate monuments that, um, that we all face today and how that um, impacts different viewers um, in really personal ways. Was Ward Lockwood native? I don't believe so. And if anyone else on staff knows, please comment. But I, I do believe that um, he, in his time, was making every effort to be sympathetic, um, or at least that's my um, limited research that I've done on his work. And we, we have a number of pieces of his in the collection, but Selka or Casey, Angela, if you have any other insights. I don't think so. I know he spent a lot of time in New Mexico. Well, and I think yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to check in regarding the time. Oh, did, did we have a one hour limit? Well, I think we can go over. <laughs> okay. We have a lot planned, so if we'll stick with us for a little longer. I mean, we can, the, the record, like we, like the Zoom won't stop. Um, I guess is what oh, I yes. to say, so. Good, good point and stand up and stretch and do what you need to do. Yeah. If you need to check out at eight, um, we'll look forward to seeing you at a future program. Yeah. But we'll hang on a little bit longer. So. Did you want me to talk about this? Sure. Um, well, what you have here are two fabulous examples of beadwork, obviously. Um, the one on the left, the, um, there is a, uh, what is the term, gauntlets. The uh, gauntlets are uh, from the Blackfeet tribe. Um, and the one on the right is actually uh, Chippewa or Ojibwe. And to me, the striking difference, of course, is the, um, the culture that's manifested by each of these objects. The traditional culture that you see on the um, Blackfeet gauntlets versus the federal symbol that you see on the little uh, bag, which makes me wonder, and uh, to the best of our um, information, it was probably late 1800s. And so we don't really know uh, if or why the tribe wanted to represent, um, you know, the United States with a um, take off on the flag and the eagle, 
or whether you, you know there were situations especially when treaties were being negotiated that um there was an exchange of gifts between the federal government and the tribes and so this may have been created for one of those uh, situations and some of you may know that especially in old is of pueblos because there are um the people who are the uh, the selected leaders of uh, most of the pueblos uh, i have actually seen wearing medallions and i i think they're gold but i'm not positive whether they're gold or silver that were given to them by the president who actually um was sitting at the time their treaty was negotiated and so i'm wondering if maybe this was a, a reciprocal gift or maybe it was even um you know a re requested somehow but i i find it very interesting and very unusual for that reason but very beautiful yeah well, the images on the right are from um, the Pine Ridge Reservation and boarding oh, school. Really? Um, yeah, and um, the 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 image on the top is of um, boys, and the image on the bottom is of girls, and so there's real gender differences, which may or may not oh. resonate. With. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't see um, our photos. Our our images are in front of those, so I'm sorry, I didn't see no. what you're talking about. Yeah. Did you want to add to that, Deanne? I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I can't really see them well. Um, but just the kinds of things that um, that were being taught in the schools to assimilate um, students and um, removing traditional culture and um, replacing it with with um, practices that were viewed as um, necessary or beneficial to society. And so you often um, find objects that are a blend of, of both tradition and these new um, either images or techniques. And so these are, I don't uh, know that these are examples of that, but they reflect um, some of that experience as well. To that, I will add that um, the young women, uh, the teenage girls who were at Haskell were domestics in homes in Lawrence. I don't know how many people know that. And it was really felt like, you know, it was very segregated according to sex. And so these are tasks that we want to treat, uh, teach the girls. These are tasks that we want to teach the boys. And of course, the girls learned homemaking, cooking, sewing, etc. And, and worked in homes. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering too, because remember, as I said earlier, that typically the boarding schools would start with the younger and add the older. And it may be that this group of young women were brought in because it was, and the, the other goal was that the boarding schools were supposed to be self-financing. And so if they were, if the families were paying for these girls to work as domestics, then that of course went into the budget of Haskell. It certainly wasn't given to the, the girls. Mm -hmm. Deanne, did you share some insights on the think, as well? This is something, yes, that I had never seen before. I want to acknowledge the fact that, um, in fact, I don't know if I can move the picture at all, because underneath it says, un, as you can probably see, under known Potawatomi maker, and then the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, Kansas. Now, those are the four states uh, where there are, and there are a couple of others, I think there are a couple of um, bands of Potawatomi in Indiana and possibly Illinois still. But so those are the states where um, uh, there are uh, Potawatomi people living currently. And um, this was given to the Spencer by the Menninger Foundation, which makes me think that this very well may have been from Prairie Band, um, but I don't know that. I find this interesting um, from the standpoint of um, a medical practitioner. I've never seen one of these before, and the staff has told me that they're, what this probably is, is um, images, depictions of various herbs or 
perhaps even liquids goodness we don't really know but there but there uh it's some sort of a code for various medicines and it's not clear whether it's how you make the medicine or what the medicine is or if it tells you uh, a plant that is medicinal or how to use plants um but but and of course the issue is is there anyone still living who even knows what these symbols mean and can actually bring them back into the culture, which reminds me of another story, which is when when I was training on the West Coast, I would come back to Kansas and or Oklahoma, depending on opportunities that were available during the summers. I worked a couple summers in the Indian Health Service Clinic in Kansas, and, and one summer I spent down in um, Oklahoma City in Claremont, Oklahoma. Home. And one night I was in the library, hospital library, looking something up, and the janitor was cleaning. And I started talking to him, and as we talked about, he was a Seminole gentleman from Oklahoma, and it came out that he was a medicine person. And, uh, and so I talked to him about how he was passing on what he knew. And he said, well, the problem is I don't have anyone to pass it on to, because mm -hmm. the thing that I so the songs and the prayers are in Seminole, and there isn't anyone uh, whom I know who knows enough Seminole to be able to learn those. And um, he and I both felt that that was so sad, but the one thing that he knew that he could not do was write it down. Because if he wrote it down, then there was the possibility that someone who shouldn't have that knowledge and worst, who would exploit that knowledge and sell that knowledge. So unless he um, found someone to pass it on to, his knowledge was gone. And that was probably uh, in the late 1970s. Thank you, Dan. So this is kind of a big shift, a big pivot um, from the prescription stick and another contemporary artist who um, we saw work by earlier. Um, and Dan, you wanted to share a few words about this one as well. Well, yes, I, I think, um, and we do have one other piece of uh, Chris Papans to share with you. Um, and the essence here is that pickups are just iconic in Indian country. I mean, they're in virtually every tribe. These days, you, you may see a nice new one, but usually they're, you know, we kind of joke about they're being held together by duct tape and prayer, and, um, but, you, but you see them everywhere. They're multifunctional as well. And I don't know, um, oh, I wish I could think of Sherman Alexie's film, his movie. Smoke signals. If anybody has seen smoke signals, you remember the reservation car, the res car that could only go in reverse. And so <laughs> right. Elaine, Elaine Miles was driving the car, and you know, you just hop in, put it in reverse, <laughs> away you went. Yeah. And we'll see. We'll see more of Chris here shortly. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, from pickup trucks to bicycles, um, bicycles play almost a character role in the book. Um, and though we don't have an image of a bicycle from a reservation or anywhere near North Dakota, we do have an image with bicycles and a dog, which was another sort of uh, recurring uh, character in the book. Um, and um, actually, you, Deanne, you're talking about the pickups held together by bubble gum and duct tape. Um, the, the passage right before this quote, um, very detailed sort of description of each of his friend, you know, Cappy and Zach and, and Angus, each of their bicycles. He doesn't describe his own, I don't think, but he's very observant in noticing um, the differences between this bright, shiny BMX and, and another one that's always sort of uh, under repair, you know, constantly. So, since we couldn't drive lead, and the pink one, that's which right, is not going to be right. exactly. So, since we couldn't drive legally, although of course we drove whenever we could, the bikes gave us freedom. Okay, and and this is. Oh yeah, somebody might want to read that. Oh yeah. So, um, so I'll go ahead and read the quote. 
Grandma hummed as she cooked at the stove. She was short and skinny and always wore flesh-colored stockings, rolled down as if it were a fashion accent to do that, and moccasins that she made herself out of deer hide. Kathy's two aunts tanned hides in their backyards. Every summer they gave a soft buckskin to grandma. Her moccasins were beaded with small pink flowers. And this is another, um, so on the right, you know, you have, um, I believe these are Ojibwe mo moccasins that are beaded. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, on, on the left, you kind of have the traditional, um, um, I'm assuming they're, they're buckskin. And then on the right, you have Chris Papon again, who has um, done an interpretation on, on a pair of vans. And I just really love this because, um, and I guess maybe looking at this through like a European Western lens, you know, so often we see these moccasins in um, displays in a museum setting or kind of in an almost like uh, anthropological setting. And so I really like the idea of thinking about these were everyday used objects that people, um, you know, walked in, mended, um, kept, and then you see um, on the right, uh, Papan's work, you know, kind of commemorating elders, um, you know, again, on a pair of shoes that you would use to, you know, get you from one place to another. So um, let me see if there's any other, yeah, Chris Papan, for instance, critiques archetypal representations of Native Americans by juxtaposing symbols of modernity, like the van sneakers and painted portraits using what he calls lowbrow pop surrealist style. Um, so it's kind of a good, um, I don't know, representation of these everyday objects that are being used, but that also are, you know, kind of questions, what belongs in a museum? What's, what's art? What's, what's useful that you can use in your everyday life? Well, and I would like to add, the reason I love these, he calls, the name of the work is Bless All Those Who Walk Here. And to me, that means not just who is walking here contemporarily, but who has walked here. And he pays homage to uh, Native elders, even as he's uh, incorporating all of these contemporary aspects to it. So to me, it's just a wonderful intergenerational piece. And there may be even some grandmas who would wear it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, sorry, that image is a little bit blurry. Um, but I, I wanted you all to see a sense of scale um, because the images on the right are, you know, probably two feet, three feet tall. Um, and the two images on the left are very much larger than life. They're floor to ceiling. So I'll skip ahead to the next image, which should be much sharper. There we go. So these are these are portraits by Ryan Redcorn, Redcorn and um, his goal, um, I think, in both is kind of um, looking at portraiture through. Um, and I and I don't know if we have pictures in here, but you but you know the old um, kind of um western photos of indians that are very much through that western european lens and then this is portraiture done um by an indigenous artist of indigenous women and we, we do have an image of um of that sort of pairing so i'll jump ahead to that but for some reason i'm not able to go backwards in slides so <laughs> sorry about that but um uh so i'll go forward to that pairing here in, in just a second Kristen. But uh, these are all images of Ryan Redcorn. Um, so again, going back to identity and the multiple identities that we all possess. Um, but do you want to share a few of, of those identities before we move on to the other slide? Yeah, yeah. So he's, um, so he's also a comedian, and he has this comedic troupe, the 1491s. Um, that of course is like the pre-Columbian period, even though I feel like that term is a little problematic. Um, but, you know, he kind of looks at his identity through these different, um, 
different lenses, but it's also he's maybe a little more in control of how he portrays himself and how he he kind of takes control of that identity by through through his comedy and through his portraiture. Um, and then his, I've, I've got the links for the 1491s and they have videos up there. So, some of them are um, perhaps a little, uh, a little body, so maybe a little PG-13 <laughs> for folks. <laughs> but I like it. And, and, and irreverent, I would say. Yes. Very yeah. Much so. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he's kind of looking at, you know, expressing himself through different modes of art. Um, and I think that's great. Yeah. And, and he's also, I mean, he has a, a national profile now. Um, he was at Obama's, one of Obama's inaugurations and has uh, testified before Congress, as you can see in the bottom image. Um, uh, that was um, the Committee on Indigenous Rights. And he's also testified on behalf of the um, Violence Against Women's Act. Uh, and then you, you see a picture of him as a father and sort of family man on the far right. So moving between these uh, different roles that he occupies. Yeah, and here's kind of the, the pairing that I was, I was thinking of. Um, you know, on the left we get um, you know, the mother and daughter posing for him. Um, and I feel like their stances are, are, you know, very powerful, like kind of a quiet, powerful stance. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's hard to tell from the women on the right, you know, kind of what their body language is, um, is saying, but they look a little, um, I don't know, a little posed, like they're not very comfortable on those chairs. And I like um, how on the left, you know, the mother is cross-legged. She's, she's kind of in a powerful repose position. Um, that's, that's what I see. If anyone else, you know, sees anything different, please jump in. I think there's probably a difference between um being able to dictate how you represent yourself or how someone represents you versus a photographer or a portraitist um, who's choosing how you're being represented, right? So that's reflected here. I don't know if any of you have ever sat for a portrait, um, whether that's, you know, just a picture that your mom has taken or something more formal, but we respond to who is behind the lens in different ways. So this is another Ward Lockwood mural sketch for discoverers and explorers in the early 1900s. And like that other mural sketch, there's sort of uh, multiple narratives being told in here. What are some sort of uh, symbols or icons that, that people can kind of pick out for us as a group? Jumps out at you. Where does your eye go first? My eye went toward the back to the cross being kind of firmly planted in. Yeah. Near the boat coming in. So I think that's the first time that we've seen a, a religious symbol in any of the images that we've looked at so far, right? So I'll jump ahead to this next grouping. Deanne, did you want to share yeah. some insights here? Yeah, so I would be happy to talk about, um, do, yes, we have three pictures here. Okay, so what you see, of course, are um, what are called missions, which are, I would guess that all three of these structures probably also so functioned as mission schools. And you see that there's one from Topeka, one from Shawnee in Wyandotte County, and the Kickapoo mission from Brown County, which I don't believe um, still exists. I'll have to check that out because I go up there fairly often and I don't recall seeing anything like that. On the other hand, closer to the Iowa Reservation, even though as long as I've known it, uh, it has been known as the Sacapox mission, which is actually farther away, 
Um, and it's just outside of Highland, Kansas, where the primary campus of Highland College is. And the thing that's interesting about these missions and mission schools is they mostly started in the mid um, 19th century. And as we were discussing when we were preparing for this um, discussion this evening, I shared that um, I had always wondered why, you know, this one was Baptist and this one was Presbyterian and the Episcopalians have the Wind River, Wind River Reservation and um, up in Dakota, they're, they're both Episcopalian and Catholic um, mission schools. And it turns out that um, sort of this ecumenical council sat down and divvied up the territories. Um, so, and I think some of the mission schools preceded the federal boarding schools, um, but I can't say that they were necessarily any more humane. I don't really know uh, much history about the religious boarding schools. I, I, I think many of us in this discussion probably know about terrible abuses that have occurred in the Catholic run schools, and I'm sure it wasn't but limited to the Catholic schools. And that's and I can tell you that there still is a retired priest living as a retired priest in a facility on the Gonzaga University campus in Washington, uh, who is known to have been an abuser, still been just kind of passed along um, to retirement. So it's, it's, it's been a terrible, terrible problem. So this is uh, an installation or an exhibition at the Spencer Museum that's been on view for several years. It's one of our long-term uh, installations of our permanent collection and it's called This Land. I hope some of you have seen it before. Um, it rewards repeat visits, um, but it explores questions of manifest destiny and at our attachment to, to land and place and um, a sense of, of belonging and who belongs. Um, on particular lands. And it's the exhibition in which our Thomas Hart Benton painting back here resides, which you might be wondering why a Thomas Hart Benton painting is, is in this talk. Um, but it's sort of, it has a, a narrative that's sort of hiding in plain sight. Um, this is a painting that we use a lot in teaching and it unfolds in a very theatrical way. Um, and I bet some of you have been on a tour where we've talked about it before. But does anyone know what the sort of thrust of the story is here? Or where does your, where does your eye lead you in this painting? Behind the tree. Behind the tree. And what, what, um, what is revealed to you behind the tree? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you ponder that uh, for a moment. Does anyone else uh, have an observation to share or? I zeroed in on the uh, fiddle player, I guess, because of uh, love for music, plus he's sort of front and center, but then immediately went to the couple mm. that's in front of the tree. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the music wondering. perhaps led you into to the couple, uh-huh. Right, mm -hmm. interesting. What, what is transpiring with the couple? I'm, I'm kind of like Kay, I'm trying to figure that out. It doesn't yeah. look pleasant. Yeah. So, I think he's just stabbed her. He has just oh, stabbed her, that's right. So, yeah, and in mm -hmm. fact, he's almost sort of tucked oh. into the curve of her dress. So it's, it's a little bit hidden. Um, and of course, she's clutching her heart and covering her wound. Um, so it's right here in the middle of the painting. You would think your eye would go right to the middle, right? Yes, yes, yes. It's very. And I just, I just saw the night. Yeah. So Thomas Hart Benton is a master storyteller wow. and um, arranger of compositions and, and has revealed in you know, just two dimensions and just a couple feet of canvas um, this whole narrative that unfolds sort of before our eyes. Um, and, and I think it relates to the book in the way that um, sexual violence is sort of a recurring theme. 
um, and some of the associated conditions that um, that are present in, in the lives of um, some of the characters. So I'm gonna advance just because I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. You all have been hanging on with us here. So we'll keep going if you would like to keep going, but we'll be sure to wrap up in the next couple of minutes here. Um, but Dan, did you wanna share a few words kind of connecting those, uh, that, that painting in, in this print here? Well, I think the two of us all agreed that we love Diego Romero's work. He works primarily in, in clay. Um, and he just has, I don't, do we have any, are we going to show the plate? Yes, we sure will. Yeah. Um, this, you want me to go this, ahead? Um, yeah, this, well, actually this piece, the fallen angel, we think it, I mean, I, I felt that we needed to bring this up because alcohol has played and continues to play a major role in Indian country. And, um, I think that things are much improved over years ago, but uh, Diego, when he was here at the Spencer, maybe two, three years ago, was very um, forthright about talking about his own problem and how he's overcome it. And I think that this is um, emblematic of that struggle. And presumably that's um, Mr. Coyote there up on the bar trying to lead him astray even though he's being so, I, his work is just extraordinary. I think I love it. And hopefully we have that other plate to share. Yeah. All right. Yeah. To the next one. Yeah. Did someone want to share a, an observation or thought? I'm sorry. Okay, we'll move on. And of course, I mean, the book and the current culture is very much thankfully focused on uh, violence against women, which of course is most prevalent um, uh, in native culture among all ethnic groups. Um, so we can't forget the role that alcohol plays uh, in that problem as well. And here is Diego. So the, the piece on the bottom right really reminded us of um, of Joe and his friends uh, sort of taking on the guise of the Star Trek characters and um, imagining them also sitting in, in a room playing video games or watching TV as, as the characters here in Diego's pottery um, are doing. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of move us through this just in the interest of time here. And actually this is right near the end. Um, these are also Diego's works, um, two representations of, of powerful women. Who, who do we have here? Who are our powerful women? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, yeah. <laughs> Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty. Lady Liberty. Lady Liberty. And are, are these the iconic images you have in your mind when you think of Wonder Woman? Is this what Wonder Woman looks like? Or what yes. the Statue of looks like? No. Anyone else have an added observation? The so Wonder Woman is actually uh, titled Kara. It's Diego's wife or as Deanne and I said, well, we hope she's still his wife. Um, but when we had Diego in town, that was his wife. Um, and, uh, and she's here presented as, as Wonder Woman. Um, and what else is going on in, in the image with Lady Liberty there? I almost think Lady Liberty's face looks like a man instead of a woman. I don't know if that's intentional or it's just my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a, a, a gender identity that's unclear. Uh -huh. She's more powerful than the male figure. <laughs> right. So what are the, the sort of signals that say to you that, that she's more powerful than the male figure? There's well, a size. Size. The size, yeah. And he looks like he's quaking in her. Mm -hmm. There's little hash marks around his arms, like he's shaking his arms. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there are these sort of arm-based symbols of, of strength and power and perhaps frustration or 
despair um, and this contrast between them. And Cassandra in the in the chat brings up that they are still married and Kara is a fantastic photographer and artist in her own right. Excellent. Thank you, Casey. Does Wonder Woman look like she might have some color to her skin? Perhaps so, yeah. Perhaps so. I mean, certainly it's a different uh, representation than the more iconic Wonder Woman that um, is based on. Right. I think she's got a lot more definition of, of bicep muscles. Heck yeah. She's super yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And confident, right? Um, and in fact, there's kind of a similar, a similar gesture on, on their faces between the two figures. There's a defiance, mm -hmm. is I guess how I would describe it, right? What's written on the tablet of the Lady Liberty? That is a great question. Does anyone know what's written on um, the original Lady Liberty tablet? Give us our tired, our poor. That, isn't it that quote, that song, give us our tired, our poor, or that poem? That that's, a that's on the plaque, but I don't know that that's on the tablet that she's holding. So the tablet is sort of the Declaration of Independence, um, but I can't zoom in, in in the mode that I'm in now to see exactly what the text says. So I invite everyone to check out our online collection because our whole collection is digitized on our website and you can zoom in. Um, and in fact, the list of this um, slideshow for, I think just for um, people who are employed or students at KU may only have access now, but we're working on making that more public. But the whole collection is searchable. Um, but we thought we would sort of wrap up or sort of conclude here with these um, images of, of uh, power and dominance and strength and um, the- Positive tension. change. Yeah, towards yeah. positive change, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then as, as we were preparing for this, just over the weekend, I saw a news alert from the Smithsonian about the digitization, just as I said, our whole collection has been digitized. Um, there's a new digitization project that's just been released to the public of hundreds of these treaties. So Jean is Adam's quilt, you know, I don't know what sort of hoops she had to go through to gain access to her research materials. Um, but they were not widely accessible. And now hundreds of them have been digitized at very high resolution and are available to the masses. Um, so this is just one of many examples um, as a result of a, a partnership. Um, so that's another, another thing that you can explore. What was the name of the artist that did the Apocalypto 2011? Again. That's Diego Romero. And we can put the name in the chat or it's probably already in there. Thanks to Angela. And okay. I put a link in the chat to all six works that we have by Diego Romero in the Spencer's collection in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Angela. So this is our final quote um, paired with, again, the image of the front of the museum. Would someone like to read this one for us as a, a wrap up? or you can read it quietly to yourself. And how funny, strange that a thing can grow so powerful even when planted in the wrong place. Ideas too, I muttered, ideas. Thank you so much. So going back to how we began and our, our statement about the land that the museum resides on and the signs that are now gracing the front of the, the building, um, and the many ideas that are contained um, and manifest through works of art um, within the museum. Uh, I've, I've heard our director, Sarah Lynn, and her colleague at the Natural History Museum refer to both museums as museums of ideas, just manifest in different ways. Um, so I, I think it's such a fitting quote from the very end of the book um, to sort of close on here. So thank you all for 
staying with us for um, much longer than we anticipated. Um, Kristen is posting a resource list in the chat and um, we're gonna hang on for a couple minutes if anyone has questions or would like to chat more privately. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the participants and I would like to thank Adina and Kristen for inviting me to participate with them. We are so honored to have your your um, critical role and voice in this, Dan. Thank you so much for all that you added to it. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, thank you to um, Adina and Deanne for all of the work that you did to put this together. So thank you, thank you. And we hope to see you back online and back at the museum and library soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, did anyone have any more any questions or thoughts before I click the end button? It's always strange to end events like this. Like, it's just kind of like kaput. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'll go ahead and hit the end button. And yeah, check out those resources um, if you're interested. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.